Let us join our hearts together to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jared, and good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you this morning, and welcome to the First Church of Christ here on this beautiful fall, crisp morning. Let's do this. Why don't we stand up and greet one another in the name of the Lord. I have some uh, quick announcements this morning, actually a number of them. We are going to be uh, having communion today, and I want to recognize three of our members who will be sharing in their first communion with us this morning. That's always a great privilege. Uh, this morning, could Haley Caracciola and Connor Caracciola and Sarah Geeky please stand up? So we can acknowledge you and just welcome you in. It's a great day, so thank you. They'll be sharing today in communion with us. We also, um, this Wednesday, are going to be having a full day of prayer service here at the church. And that prayer service is actually going to start at 9.30 in the morning and go through 8.30 that evening. And there are all different types of ways in which you could be involved at different times throughout the day. So if you will, you will actually receive one of these on your way out, and it gives you the full schedule of our prayer events for that day. We'll have some prayer walks and communion, and the evening we'll have some music and prayer. We also are looking to respond to that great tragedy that happened. Uh, there are still folks in New York City who are without power across the seaboard here. And uh, what's going to happen is... Um, 
Christina Yagel's brother, a relative, lives in one of the areas that was hardest hit and still without power and lights. And we're going to be collecting uh, items for them, and it's going to be taken to the people who need them directly. Uh, so we'll be collecting those items through Wednesday of this week. And uh, what you can imagine they would need is probably just about everything, but the things that are being asked for in particular are coats, clothing, blankets, non-perishable food items are in big need, bottled water, boots, shovels, uh, batteries, etc. You know, just about anything you could imagine because almost everything in some of these cases that a person owned was totally uh, lost. And another way that we're going to be responding is we will be collecting our Good Samaritans offering this morning. And that offering is going to be sent directly to the uh, Presbyterian Church in New York City to their Good Samaritans Fund. And they will be distributing the uh, money directly to those people in need. So there's a couple of ways that we can reach out and be friends to those people who have gone through such a hardship with this last storm that we, uh, we endured. So let us join our hearts together in these words of scripture. Sing to God the praise to his name. Uh, Him who extols and rides on the clouds. His name is the Lord. And rejoice before him. He is a father to the fatherless and a defender of widows. Let us join together and worship our Lord.
morning. Please remain standing for our call to worship. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in God's holy place? Those with clean hands and pure hearts who do not lift up their souls to what is false. Such is the company of those who seek the Lord, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. seated. Will you join with me in our opening prayer of confession? God of compassion and mercy, you wipe the tears from our eyes that we may behold the new heaven and new earth. We come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving. In Christ, promise that you will never forsake us. Because of your spirit, your abiding presence is forever with us. In you is our firm conviction that death will be no more, and mourning and crying will cease. For the first things have passed away, and we dwell in the assurance of your eternal life Even as we pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
I believe I've heard it said before. How do you follow that? Thank you. Um, good morning again. And before I start off this morning, I want to just try to place this sermon in a context. Um, we have a vision here at First Church, and our vision is this. It is to foster a grassroots movement of kingdom communities who love God and love others in profound ways and live to extend his kingdom. And the vision is not only a direction, but it's also a way in which we want to live. And to help us get there, we have what's called our mission, and I'm sure that we're all pretty much familiar with our mission. Our missional statement is that we love God, love one another, and make disciples. So we've got that one down. Is this a little too high or too low? My voice too low, it's a little throwing. Okay, is that better? And, uh, and the way we describe this in our literature, which is out there on that table, is we have three arrows. And these arrows are the direction pointers. And they're pointing upward, which I hope we're going toward. And what we call these arrows is our pathways. And we have these three pathways that go along with our missional statement. The first pathway is spiritual formation, loving God. The second pathway of loving one another is our community pathway. And the third pathway is called our missional pathway, and that is our making disciples. And with these pathways to help us along this journey, we have a rule of life that we, that we all come under, this umbrella called the rule of life. And the message today is taken from that rule of life. Um, and that message is on the second priority, we call them. And our second priority is called capacity. And capacity means this. My heart's size is the capacity that I have to love. And so for us to increase our capacity would mean that I have the greater ability to love others in a godly way and uh, be with them in relationship in a right way. So our first priority, if you remember, is identity. We first have to understand that we are loved. Because we don't love because we love. We love him because he loves us first. And so once we understand that place where our identity comes from, that increases our capacity to love others and to make disciples. So that's the basic context of the sermon today, and that's where we're coming from with our rule of life. And I think there will be a couple of more sermons on that following this one. And the context we're preaching from this morning, from the scripture, comes out of the Gospel of John. It's found in chapter 15, verses 14 and 15, if anyone would like to turn there. The scripture says this, You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for you know, these words. And Father, we understand that they're more than words. They're actually an invitation that you're giving us to understand and to know you better. And to understand how to have a relationship with you in a greater way. So we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lead us, that your Holy Spirit would guide us, that your Holy Spirit would fill this place, Lord, and that you would give us ears to hear what you would have us hear today, and you would give us strength to follow that. So we pray, Father, and thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we ask your blessing upon your word, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So the word rule of life, or the term rule of life, comes from, I believe it's a Latin word, that we know as trellis. A trellis is um, um, it's a structure. And so as we're identifying the rule of life, what we're doing is we're kind of spelling out that we have a structure. It's a structure not like a rule that's made to bind us or confine us or any of those things. It really is there to be a marker and kind of a guide and a place we build around to increase our friendship with Christ. 
Jesus also spoke of himself in this previous in previous passages here in this chapter that he was the true vine and that we are his branches. And I believe we've all seen a grapevine. And we all understand that a grapevine grows on what would be called a simple and sometimes a more elaborate trellis. But the reason why the trellis is there is because it allows the grapevine and the grapes to receive the most amount of sunshine. It gives them space in between where air can flow so they don't get diseased. And it uh, also allows the person who's tending the vine an easier access to all the different parts of the vine so that the vine itself and the branches are producing not only the most productive grapes, because it's not a matter of just doing, it's actually they want to produce the best grapes. And why would they want to produce the best grapes, I ask you? Because the best grapes make the best wine. And that's why, you know, the husbandman was always after the best grapes. But there's another thing that happens with this trellis. Since we're the branches grafted into the vine, what the trellis does is gives the maximum amount of ability for the branch to actually gain strength. And that strength in the branch that's going to help it stay grafted is going to help it to be productive and going to help it to be even more fruitful. Jesus said this, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, that, by the way, is Jesus' rule of life, you can ask whatever you will, and my Father, and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. So the person who's tending the vine, they love the vine. There's no doubt about it. They love the branches. They tend to the branches. They care for the branches. But their delight, really, is in the harvest. There's nothing, I think, you know, more prideful, if you will, or, or joyful than for me to go out into a garden and find something that's beautifully ripe. You know, knowing the labor I put into it, knowing that this came from a tiny seed or a tiny bud or a tiny plant, and here it is producing these great, wonderful, um, these great, wonderful fruits. So the Father's delight is in his harvest. So the trellis is a rule of life for here. Here again, it's not to restrict, but it's to help us be more fruitful. And that really is for the Father's glory. Now, I don't know about you, my walk with Jesus Christ for a period of time was difficult. It was just, in some ways, almost frustratingly maddening. Just didn't seem like I could make it anywhere. Some friends took time to mentor me. They took time to disciple me. And there were a lot of things missing from my past. A lot of things, a lot of holes, a lot of places where I didn't learn what you really need for some basic skills. And these people took their time to mentor me. And something happened I considered to be quite profound. My life was transformed. My life was changed by the power of God. And what's happened since that day is I've got to witness the, the harvest, if you will. And I don't know if you've ever seen what happens when God takes ashes, the ashes of life, and he turns them into something that's absolutely beautiful and wonderful and productive. Or he takes this whole this desolation, this loneliness, this wound within a child or within our hearts. And God fills it with light and God fills it with hope. And all of a sudden, there's a transformation occurring within that person. And I don't know about you, one time, not only was I lost spiritually, I was lost physically in the great pine forest of Texas in the seventh grade, wandering around doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing. Therein lies some of the problem. Uh, most of the problem, actually. But anyways, I was lost. And when someone discovered us, and it wasn't for a great period of time, but it was enough to make enough fear in my heart because it was totally pitch black. We had no light. And someone discovered us. And you know what? There was great joy. I was really happy. It was a profound experience to be lost and to be found. And it's the same thing true for the lost in this world or those who are wandering around in darkness and those who have no hope. When they find a connection to God and know that they're loved and know that they belong and know that they have a place and know that they'll be cared for, those are profound moments that can transform a life. And when a life is transformed, a family can be transformed. And this is the way that communities are transformed. I don't know about you, but God has invited us to have a front row seat with him 
in his activity. And this is to my Father's glory, that we bear much fruit, that we see the harvest. At one point, even when it wasn't harvest time, he said, don't wait for that. He said, look up now, because the harvest is white and ready. And I'll tell you this, I believe God is always moving around us. The problem with that is that I'm not always paying attention. I don't know if your life gets busy. I don't know if you're bombarded with a hundred other things pulling us in a, a million directions. But sometimes our life and our attention isn't always on God. And sometimes we don't see him acting around us. Out there in the literature, too, we also have on that paper with the arrows and some others, there's this wavy line. This wavy line is called a disciple's journey. And I like the wavy line. The wavy line goes up and the wavy line goes down. And the wavy line goes up and the wavy line goes down. And the wavy line starts over here. It says, you know, maybe I'm a seeker of God. Maybe I'm just looking for God. Maybe I'm even questioning whether it, there is a God. That's where they're at on their journey. And others up here might be a fully devoted person to Christ, following him with everything that they know how to. And that's where they're on their journey. But the point when you look at that is this, there are other stages in between. And it's not just a straight trajectory, it's this wavy line. And I really do believe that that is our disciples' journey. You know, sometimes I am on top of the mountain, and other times I'm down there living in the shadow. But the point to that is this, it's a journey, and it's okay that we're on the journey. It's just a matter of my commitment and where I keep my heart pointing in that journey. I don't know about you, but my marriage sometimes has ups and downs. Has any of you ever experienced an up and down in your marriage? Oh, no one? Well, neither has mine. Then, no. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, but what it is, is my marriage and my marriage to my wife and my wife's marriage to me is a lifelong commitment. The in-between is what we work out and keep working toward and doing. And that's the same thing with our journey as disciples of Jesus Christ. It's okay we are where we are. That's okay. It's okay sometimes that I'm not the best that I should be because it's the progression that matters. It's not the trajectory, but if you look at the end of the journey, it started off down here and it ends up up here. The progression overall is upward. And that's what we need to see in that. So we're on... Oh, that's my word. Sorry. You guys wouldn't even have known that if I hadn't made that noise. So. <laughs> Anyways, it's a lifelong journey... And, and uh, let me ask you another question. Has anyone ever, ever here, uh, do you know how to eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, that's right. This lifelong journey is taken in bite-sized pieces. And I've always said this, if I'm going to have the task of eating an entire elephant, I might as well learn how to enjoy it. You know, I might as well make some barbecue elephant. I might as well have elephant stew one night. Um, you know, just, just make a little variety in there. And that's along the pathway, too. We have these different pathways of community and missions and spiritual formation. And in this, it's not drudgery. You know, if I had to eat elephant every day and I hated elephants, wondered, what a drudgery, huh? But if I learn to really love what I'm doing and learn to love the journey and learn to love being a part of this, it makes that so much nicer. And I learned that it's okay to have diversity within the body of Christ. It's a great gift to have diversity. I need things from people out here in the congregation that I can't get from other people. A lot of you have helped me in ways that have been tremendous in diverse ways that other people don't know how to help me. And I have gifts that I can share with people that others might not have because of the places I've been. Diversity within the body and mixing it up a little bit and getting to know other people and taking steps out of our circles can be very powerful for where we grow. And in that too, when you have to eat an elephant, we should know where we get, we've got to start because where do you start carving an elephant, you know? <laughs> and anyways, so we would call this our first priority going back to that rule of life. And that first priority is so very important and, the, and there's a reason why it's first is because we have to know the truth. We have to know the truth about who we are in God and how he loves us. We have to know the truth that we are secure as children of God. We have to know the truth that it's okay to be on that journey. It's okay to mess up sometimes. It's okay not to be perfect. And God is still going to love us the same as he's always loved us. Because if we do not have that security, we will be afraid to take risks. We'll be afraid to take chances. We'll be afraid to fail. 
I have to have the security of a place I can come back to that says it's okay. I still love you. You're still a person I love. What you did or this mistake, but that's okay. We've learned that that way doesn't work. I loved Edison. He, he never looked at the word failure. He just says, okay, at the, at the whatever hundredth try. We know that way doesn't work now. I just think that's such a great framework to work out of, and I really do believe that it's God with us, and that we have to know that he's patient and long-suffering and that he desires us. Without that truth, the temptation and the lie that the world offers, that the world has something better for us than what God can give us, that the world knows how to meet our needs in a way that God doesn't know how to meet them. That temptation will pull us away from the true vine and we'll get grafted into something that will only bring us thorns within our life. We have to know that to stay grafted in. I have to be committed to the process. Even if it doesn't seem like the process is working right now, God's commitment to me is there, and I need that commitment to, to him. Jesus told his friend, Peter, Peter, you're going to fail me. But Peter, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. It's a powerful statement. Peter, I know you're going to fail. I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. When you fail, I'm praying that you still have the faith to get up and keep moving in the right direction. That's really what it's about. Jesus, isn't, Jesus knows I'm going to fail. Jesus knew his friends were going to fail. But Jesus said, don't lose faith in me. Keep coming even if you fail. Keep coming if you have made mistakes. Keep coming. And I will keep coming to you because I'm here for you. And we need to understand that because our faith is not in our strength. Our faith is not in our goodness. Our faith isn't in our abilities. Our faith is in Jesus Christ and the abilities of God Almighty. And a lot of times we confuse what we believe the situation is saying and we think the situation is bigger than God. Let me just say this. God is bigger than the situation. So when God loves me, what he's saying is this. Anyways, but, it, but there's a lot of confusion on what the word love means, and I think a lot of us might have different descriptions of that. But here's one way that I've come to understand the Greek word agape. Agape is what God does for us. It's really a, a value system. It's what I value. And I'll show you what I mean. If God really has a high value for me, he would be willing to pay a high price for me. That would determine the value. If I'm buying something that has no value, I might give someone 20 cents for it. If I'm buying something that has the greatest value, I might invest my life into it. And what God did and showed us the value of who we are, what he agape, is he sent the only begotten son to die for us and pay our ransom. That's a huge price. There must be something of great value to God in you and to me. And so let me describe agape one more time and how this works because it's so important that our identity is based in this and our identity is working out of this love. Has any of you out there been pregnant? And guys, do not raise your hands. <laughs> has, has any of you given birth to a baby? This is such a great example. I, I was born once, believe it or not, yeah. But anyways, here's this woman screaming on the table, just screaming agony. You know, she's maybe even cursing, I don't know. But she's just, you know, there's some pain going on there. And, and there's this distress. And then five minutes later, they bring this tiny little bundle wrapped up in a blanket. And you see these tears begin to well up in the woman's eyes. And she begins to cry. And there's something that happens at that moment. Her value for that baby has changed from pain to something I can't ever let go of. That's agape. That baby has accomplished this. It's screamed and it's breathed. That's the extent of its accomplishments. But here it is, having great value to not only the woman, but to the husband and the father as well. You see, value and love isn't based on performance. It isn't based on what we do. That baby is loved because it's that baby. And we're loved because we're God's children that way. Even if a woman could forget her child, Jesus said, I will never forget Israel or you because I've engraved you on the palm of my hand. And that's the love that God has for us. And in that love, the way he continues to, to, to demonstrate it is this way. 
Oh, there's a second glass of water. How very thoughtful. (laughs) You guys didn't need to know that either, did you? (laughs) But anyways, because Jesus goes on here and says this, you know, that he calls us not only that we're loved as his children, but he calls us his friend. And that word friend is bantered around so much these days. What does the word friend mean? Because I know you can be a BFF, which is best friend forever. Well, ever. You know? And then all of a sudden, you're unfriended from the Facebook page that you used to be the BFF on. You know, I'm beginning to wonder if we know what the word forever means, too. You can be a best friend, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a casual friend. What exactly is Jesus saying here when he says, I call you my friend? Friendship in the scripture here is talking about philo. And philo, I believe, especially in this context we're dealing with, is talking about an experiential relationship. I have experienced you for who you are fully, and you have experienced me for who I am. You know me, and I know you, and yet we both choose to still be friends. You know, that's what friendship is getting at here. I've experienced your faults, your warts, your you know, your quirks, you've experienced mine and we still love one another. We still want to be with one another. We still want to know one another. We still want to keep having relationship with one another. And this is really where the heart's value is shown because if love is value, my actions is going to prove what I really value. If I say I value something and I look at my checkbook and I've only given it $2, if I say I value someone and I haven't called them in six months, question might be, To what degree do I love them or value them? And that's not to say we can't have long-term relationships that don't go that way. I'm just trying to make a point here, not trying to beat anybody in any way. So, you know, what we look at is is our values. And what Jesus valued, he said, I value so much I've come to die for you, but I also want to have an ongoing relationship with you. This is really showing us how much he really values us. I want you to be my friends. And he proved this because he had friendship with his disciples and his disciples you know, became his friends. He was a friend with drunks. Oh, my word. He was a friend with, you know, other people who were sinners. He was a friend with people like me. You know, Jesus became our friends, and he said, I want to have this relationship with you. I don't care where you're coming from. There were a lot of people that Jesus came to that did not want to be his friends. But as many as received him, as many as became his friends, gave he power to become the sons of God. So Jesus has proved he wants to be a friend with us. And what he's asking us to do is be a friend. And you know what he told his friends to do when he was being, you know, leaving? He told his friends to do kind of what our mission statement, I mean our vision statement says. Go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them whatever I've taught you, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and lo, I'm with you ever until the end of the ages. Go and foster kingdom communities. Go and love one another and love people in profound ways. Go and extend my kingdom. This is exactly what Jesus asked his friends to do thousands of years ago, and this is just exactly what Jesus is asking his friends to do today. Remember the elephant question? Well, what's some bites that we might be able to start taking? What's some ways that we can start making a difference? I believe 85 to 90% of the problems that exist within our society could be solved and healed by a kingdom community. Most of the things that people suffer with and a lot of illnesses are born out of loneliness. They're born out of isolation. They're born out of people who don't have basic skills in relationship, relationship with God, relationship with one another. They're born out of some very simple problems that friendship and relationship could ease and in a lot of ways eradicate and correct. But it takes time and it takes friendship to do that. And let me say this, it might seem like simple things, but that person who came up and mentored me had a profound effect on me. He had a profound effect on my family. He's had a profound effect on my grandchildren. I don't even see the person anymore. But I've needed people to come impart things to me because I don't have them. And they might not be grandiose, gigantic things, but they might be. We give what we're supposed to give to those we're supposed to give to. And the way we extend his kingdom, the way we extend, maybe in my life group we're going to take on another person and befriend another person. 
maybe in my circle, I'm going to go out of my way to make a friend with somebody. And you not just do a good work. We're not going to quit doing those. But this is about relationship, experiential relationship. You know, maybe I'm going to take on a difficult person. Maybe I'm going to become a friend with someone like Wayne. Ask my wife. I can be really difficult. <laughs> uh, she can be too, though. <laughs> this is my story, not hers. Anyways, and, I, and you ask, does it make a profound difference? It does make a profound difference. It makes a huge difference in someone's life. And the thing that's really here is, I don't have to be perfect, or I don't have to be smart enough, and I don't have to be good enough. All I have to do is say, yes, Jesus, I want to be your friend. Yes, I understand this. Yes, I get it that you love me. Yes, I, I get it that you'll teach me. Yes, I get it that it's okay that I confess that I'm not all that in a slice of bread, that I have some issues, that I need some help. It's okay that I'm there because I'm on a journey. Nobody's expecting me, and I'm not expecting you, and God's not expecting us to be finished and perfect. So in closing, this time for the good <laughs> on this one, uh, in closing, I want us to remember, you know, little things do matter. People really do matter, no matter who they are. Jesus' love was shed abroad to all that would receive him. He loved tax collectors. He loved sinners. He loves guys like me and guys like you. He loves us all. And what he's asked us to do is go out and make a new friend. Go extend my kingdom to somebody today. And in that, our communities and our church and we will be changed so that we are living out to the vision that he's called us to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word that you've given to us. We thank you for the fact that you've called us to be your friends, that you've wanted a relationship with us all along. Lord, help us to say yes. Yes to you wherever we are on our journey. Yes to you whether we're just exploring and looking. You know, it's okay to ask Jesus, you know, to, to show himself even in a more real way to you. Yes to you in knowing that you're the truth, the way, and the life. And yes, to going out and making new friends along the way. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen.
seated. At a certain point, once again, during uh, our morning prayer, uh, I will pause to give all of us a time to pray in silence for those things that I will lift up for us as we pray for ourselves, for Christ church, and for uh, God's world. So let us once again be together in prayer. O loving, eternal, and faithful God, of glorious majesty, of dazzling splendor. This morning, we bless you for calling us to be a holy people, calling us to be a people whose identity is rooted in Christ's sacrificial love for us that never changes. We bless you uh, for allowing us to be in service to each other for the sake of your world, to, yes, be bread broken for the sake of the world that you've redeemed, for the opportunity to live for you in joyful service. Oh, God, we would pray that our congregation here at First Church will experience more and more a rich and free sharing of the gifts you have generously given to us to be used for your purposes. Knowing that we are called to be saints, we humbly ask that you will work powerfully through us to accomplish your purposes, even this coming week, at work, at school, in the neighborhood, places where we volunteer and places where we serve here in this part of the body of Christ. And as we go into a a new week, Lord, we pray for the courage, the patience, and the generosity of spirit that comes from imitating the love you have shown us in Christ but even more your love radiating in and through us, through union with your Son. God, we long for your Spirit's power to make us more like Christ in how we think and how we speak and how we act. Help us, gracious God, to... Think of others and their needs even now as we pray for creation in its groaning. And we think especially of the millions up and down the eastern seaboard of our country recovering from hurricane, the hurricane here in Connecticut and throughout this great region. Hear our prayers for those in need. Lord, we would ask that you would use the offering this morning that you would bless it and multiply it to bring um, aid to those who will be recipients of it. And we pray for other organizations, the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, and many others that will be giving money and clothing and food to help uh, people rebuild their lives. We pray today, O God, for the world in its suffering Help us not to forget those parts of the the Middle East and those nations that continue to be in great uh, turmoil.
Oh God, we pray for our nation as we move into this momentous uh, season of national and statewide uh, elections. We pray that you would grant us uh, great wisdom. We pray that we would be faithful in voting. We thank you that we have that opportunity. But we do also pray for our nation and for our, our city, for this region and for the cities across this land uh, because, Lord, uh, we are in need of healing. I thank you, O oh God, that our prayers this morning through the Holy Spirit and in the communion of saints is that our worship and our, our prayers are united with our brothers and sisters around the globe today, for your church is one. Also, our worship is united with the church in heaven. And we humbly ask uh, that you would hear our prayers on behalf of the church worldwide, but also uh, this congregation, and also the missionaries we support, and always we, we ask that you would remember in uh, your mercy the persecuted church. And most holy Father, as we are about to approach the holy table of your Son, Jesus Christ, to break bread together and to drink of the cup, we are aware that we need deep cleansing through the shed blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so in silence we bring before you those besetting sins, those things that we know that we must lay once again at the foot of your cross, beseeching you for forgiveness and for grace to amend our lives. And so we pray in the strong name of Jesus Christ, Holy Father. We pray in his name because he is the author and the finisher of our faith, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And again, all God's people said, Amen. warm welcome this morning to all of our visitors. We hope that you will stay, join us in the Wells Fellowship area for coffee and cookies and fellowship, and also stop by our Welcome Center where you'll receive a gift of a Bible, information about our church, and church volunteers will talk to you this morning. It's the Vinings. Thank you. Let us um, pass the friendship registers, which are located under the ends of the pews and continue to worship God by presenting him with our tithes and our morning offerings. The ushers could come forward.
blessings you bestow upon us, and we return to you our gifts and offerings this morning. We pray that you show us how we can serve you, and we thank you that we can serve those in need. Praise and worship you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.
hear our Lord's invitation to his table this morning. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If those who hear my voice open the door, I will come in to them and eat with them and they with me. The psalmist wrote, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are all who find refuge in God. Again, let us be together in prayer. O holy God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, with joy we give you thanks and praise today. Especially we thank you for saints and martyrs, faithful people in every age who have followed your son and witnessed to his resurrection that strengthened by their witness and supported by their fellowship, we may run with perseverance the race that lies before each of us and with them one day receive the unfading crown of glory. How wonderful are your ways, O oh God. How marvelous is your name, for you alone are God, and you call us by name. Therefore, with apostles and prophets and that great cloud of witnesses who live for you beyond all time and space, this morning especially we lift our hearts in joyful praise and thanksgiving. We praise you for sending your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be born of Mary, to live among us full of grace and truth. We thank you that he made you known to all who received him, sharing in our joy and sorrow. He healed the sick and was a friend of sinners. Obeying you, Jesus took up his cross and died that we might live. And so we praise you that he overcame death and is risen to rule the world. He is in our midst this morning. We thank you that he is still the friend of sinners, for we are your beloved children, but we know that we sin. We fall short of your glory, and yes, we miss the mark. But your love never changes. And so we trust him to overcome every power that can hurt or divide us. And believe that when he comes in glorious splendor, we will celebrate one day victory with him. Therefore, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, together we take this bread and this cup. Gracious God, we ask that you would pour out now your Holy Spirit upon us, that this bread and this cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord, and that we and all who share this feast may be one with Christ and he with us. Fill us with eternal life that with joy we may be his faithful people until we feast with him in glory. And so through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. And again, all God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> On the night in which our Lord was betrayed and arrested. He took bread in his pure hands. He blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken, which is given for you. As often as you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. 
Beloved, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take this holy sacrament in remembrance that Christ gave his life for you, his body and his blood, and feed on him in your hearts with thanksgiving. Come, for all things are now ready. In the same way, after supper and after giving thanks, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is 
the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your bodies and souls unto eternal life. Together let us drink with heartfelt joy and thanksgiving.
Will you join me as we give thanks in prayer? O oh, gracious and eternal God, we do give you heartfelt thanks. We thank you for the simplicity and yet the majesty of being at Christ's table. For it is a foretaste of the feast that one day your people will celebrate with you in the eternal kingdom. When all things are made new and there is a new heavens and a new earth and how we long for that day. But we thank you, O gracious God, that as we have fed upon the body and the blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, by faith, we've been renewed, we've been assured of the forgiveness of our sins, and we are now energized to go and walk together in faith, serving you as we go out into the world. That is truly in need of your healing touch, of your salvation. And so help us to be a faithful people this new week, and we give you thanks through Christ. Amen. Amen.